So good morning everybody, those of you who prefer to stay inside rather than enjoy the good weather, I'm happy about that. We tried to get bad weather but we didn't succeed for the whole week, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my great honor to introduce the next uh, speaker, Situ Fidjil Yakumar of uh, University of Edinburgh. I think most of you are familiar with many of the things that he and his group did in the last few years. Um, maybe the work on, on impedance um, is, is a bit less well known because they've only started working on that the last two or three years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I've reached some very interesting results. You can compare some of the results with the ones uh, attained at DLR with respect to modeling impedance control and uh, in Seto's lab, it's more learning methods. So, welcome Seto and thank you for joining us. Okay. Is that audible? Yes, okay. Um, welcome everybody and uh, a big thank you to Patrick for um, organizing this uh, wonderful meeting in this wonderful place. Um, and um, it's that time of the, uh, the, the, the summer school where um, it's right in the bang in the middle. So um, you're sort of thinking, uh, we are overloaded with all this information but it's not quite right at the end, so I can't go home. Uh, so everybody's wishing, wish, wishing basically, if uh, you had more ferries to the, to the mainland, then we could have used it. But anyway, I'll try and keep um, this talk um, as lively as possible and um, uh, make it um, such that uh, it can be as interactive as possible. Um, the, over, the, over the past two days, you've actually seen um, experts talking about how to deal with um, getting robots to move in the way you want it to move. For example, how do you deal with contacts? How do you um, do impedance uh, control on sophisticated robots? Um, we also had talks on how humans modulate impedance. Um, however, um, for all these things to happen, whenever you do a task, you also need uh, to specify what you want to do with it. In other words, how you reach for some place or how do you actually, um, you know, what sort of modulation of the stiffness do you really require? In many cases, it may be very obvious, but in many other cases, it may not be very obvious. So this con comes under the sort of regime of planning. Um, so uh, in, in today's talk, uh, my talk and uh, uh, later on, um, so Antonio's talk, uh, the, a lot of the content will be on, on, on planning. So let me sort of start you off by sort of just putting this up and saying um, planning is a hard problem because you've got to deal with redundancies. And there are classical redundancies that we've all been used to in robotics. Um, for example, um, you've got task to end effector trajectories. In other words, if you have to make a movement from A to B, there are many different ways of getting there. So that's um, choosing one of these paths is resolving redundancy. Um, now, you can have redundancy at the level of end effectors to joint angles, and this is typically the inverse kinematics redundancy problem. Um, you also have redundancy at the level of joint angles to joint torques, so you could realize the same joint angles in some actuators with multiple uh, torques. Um, and more interestingly, for, the, for this uh, in the context of this summer school, um, redundancy is the level of joint torques to joint stiffness or variable impedance. So, in some sense, I'm treating the problem of variable impedance at the same level of saying I'm going to deal with, de deal with resolving redundancies in a smart, efficient, uh, reasonable way. Okay, so what do I mean by redundancy at the level of uh, variable impedance? Um, so, Here's an example of a um, little sort of by one degree of freedom spring-driven agonist antagonistic muscle, um, sorry, uh, muscle-based uh, robot. And this is hooked up directly with the EMG of the person. And you can sort of directly transfer the motor signals onto the springs. And this is now moving with low stiffness. Now, the redundancy comes in when you start co-contracting, as most of you um, already know in, this, um, in the summer school. So here you have co-contraction, uh, you change the properties, or the dynamics of the actual plant. Um, so how does it change? Um, so if there's an external perturbation, uh, and if you're not co-contracting, it's prone to uh, get deflected more. Um, on the other hand, if you co-contract, then you 
change the dynamic properties of this uh, of, of the plant. So the idea is um, given that you can modulate the uh, the dynamics of a plant uh, by modulating stiffness. Um, how do you actually compute what is the optimal uh, spatiotemporal pattern of uh, stiffness modulation? So there are many ways of doing that, um, and. Um, a typical ingredient that you would require for doing something like that is, first of all, have a plant. Uh, for example, the Makepa, um, and Bram and guys are here um, who have been working on the Makepa and have been responsible for, for creating um, this plant. And we will actually use some of these uh, designs in, in the work that we've done at Edinburgh. Uh, or uh, you've seen some talks about the DLR, uh, variable impedance arm. Um, so you need a, you need a stiffness, um, you need a robot capable of varying stiffness. And you need an optimization framework for figuring out what is the right set of um, commands to send. OK. so. So again, as a sort of basic fundamental tutorial about what planning and optim optimal feedback control is, you can think of it as a little cartoon like this, where open loop control typically separates the task, the, the task of planning, or the trajectory planning. So given a task, you have a trajectory planner, you solve some inverse kinematics based on some optimization criterion, and then generate commands based on either inverse dynamics model um, or a combination with feed forward, sorry, with feedback commands. And this you've seen many times in, in, in the talks earlier. Um, as opposed to that, an optimal feedback controller combines the, the optimization um, with the actual um, plot planning. So you optimize a cost function so that, so, so the, the planner and the dynamics are not separate. So you'll see later on that this helps you in really exploiting the natural dynamics of the system. OK, so, so what are the basic ingredients for doing something like optimal feedback control? So you're, you want to be given, given a start and end state, given for the moment, let's say, a fixed time horizon, and some system dynamics which specifies how the system reacts to a force X, uh, sorry, force U, how the system changes its state. So given a basic system dynamics equation and assuming some cost function, say you have a combination of some final cost um, if you are hitting or reaching for something and some running cost, so typically energetics. If you're given a combination of these costs, then you want to apply some statistical optimization technique to find a control law that minimizes this cost function. So that's the fundamental. Now, there are many ways of achieving this optimization. Um, I can list a few here. Um, and if you have, for example, analytical, uh, if, you have, if you have a, a quadratic cost function um, and um, a, a linear model and a quadratic uh, noise function, then you get an LQR problem. You, or you can have, an, uh, with, with the noise, you can have an LQG problem. Um, if these assumptions are violated, then you can use an iterative local optimization method, uh, typically called ILQG or ILDP. Um, and you can also use other reinforcement-like techniques, um, which come under the domain of dynamic programming. And some of the techniques that we've, all, we've worked on is um, inference-based methods, so Bayesian methods, um, typically called approximate inference methods um, for solving this problem. Uh, and this is some work, the PI squared work is some work coming from the lab of Bert Kappen um, and Stefan Schall um, on optimizing techniques. So uh, for, the, for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't really matter which optimization technique that you use. Um, the only thing you need to understand is what typically comes, sorry, yeah, what typically comes out of this optimization, what is the product of this optimization using any of these algorithms is that given some dynamics model of the plant, given some cost function inclus inclusive of a target, um, your optimal feedback controller will give you a set of temporal commands, the use, and a set of gains. So how are these gains used? In a, in a control law, these gains um, Basically, the, 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 the commands or the, um, 
the, the plant commands uh, gets added on with this term, which is basically the corrective term um, like a PD control, but now the gains are specified. So the gains also come out of the specification. So um, again, I'm not going to get across the basics of um, stochastic optimal control in the 10 minutes I possibly have for that. So, but for the purposes, there are the very good reference books. Uh, you can come and talk to me afterwards about what is a good reference for this. But that's, that's the essence. So now what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is, is to use this fundamental framework that I talked about, um, in the, sorry, in the first half of the talk, use this fundamental framework and show you interesting work that we've done with it. OK, so um, my title said, Optimize or yes. The feedback. You mean this one here? Um, the gains are designed to be linear, especially if you use it with a, um, a kind of a local linear approximator where you sort of in individually approximate local gains. But, but in general, it doesn't have to be. Yes. Temporal. Temporally. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So um, now using this framework, um, let's. So my title said, "Do we want to optimize or imitate um, impedance profiles?" So let's first start with this formulation of optimizing. So if you're given some actuator dynamics, which we know, and you assume the knowledge of the cost being optimized, then we can do various things with this framework. So I'm going to give you examples of each of these three things, um, one at a time. Uh, and some of the details are in some of the references that are at the bottom. Um, these slides are going to be made available. Um, so if you've got very, very specific questions, i would rather refer you to the, the paper. But uh, please feel free to interrupt if things are not clear. OK, so first thing, explosive movement task, things like throwing. Um, so let me give you a short video of that. So this is, um, oh, before I do that, um, so this is using a two-link Makepa um, arm. And what you're going to see is a behavior of throwing, which is not the, the, the actual trajectories, the impedance profiles, the trajectories, and the stiffness um, uh, is not designed by hand. It comes out of optimization. So what comes, um, we've just given the cost function which says maximize throwing distance uh, with some small penalty on the energy for regularization. And this is what comes out. So that's David. He's sitting somewhere in the audience. OK. so. So this is a nice example of how you can actually generate more forces than is capable by the individual motors of the joint. So using this sort of energy storage principle and swinging back and forth, and, and that can be a very good baseball picture. Um, OK, so, so to achieve this, uh, what are the basic uh, elements that you need? Again, you need um, a robot capable of varying stiffness. And then it's the same three ingredients that I talked about earlier. But being a bit more specific, um, you need a model of the system. So for the moment, let's assume we're given the model of the system. Uh, you need some sort of control objective. In this case, for throwing, it could be something like you penalize um, the negative of the distance, or, or you, you want to maximize the distance, uh, and you penalize some effort cost. Um, and then you basically run the optimizer. Um, and so, so the, the nice things that we learned from this uh, um, ex experiment or this uh, um, work was, for the first time, we could actually quantitatively show the benefits of stiffness modulation. So what we did was we looked at how, um, for example, in terms of task distance, uh, if you had an optimal fixed stiffness, um, but when I say fixed stiffness, it doesn't mean the stiffness doesn't vary. What I mean is the motor which controls the stiffness is, is constant. It doesn't move. So you optimize that. And then you allow the, uh, the optimal modulation of the stiffness. And then we compared the results. And we got um, indeed clear advantages when um, this was presented at RSS. When we allowed the stiffness to vary, we got um, increased 
task performance. Um, so, for example, uh, you'll see first, this is with optimal variable stiffness. And you'll see in a, a close-up that the, both the motors move. So, so now this pre-tensioning as well as the equilibrium position control uh, motor moves. But now in the second one, this motor won't move. So everything else, the cost is exactly the same, but the distance allowed thrown is, is much less. So that's fixed. So basically, this is a nice illustration of saying that actually varying impedance um, is a good thing to do. And here's a quantitative uh, example of that. Um, and additionally, we had some interesting insights about, so there's always this debate versus, you know, why should DLR build this, um, uh, this, this robot, which is, you know, you have this nice lightweight robot with active stiffness, and they go ahead and invest um, in building um, something with, with, with passive stiffness. So is there real evidence that passive stiffness is really, really good? And so energy storage. So, so this is, again, uh, a nice um, illustration that when you have throwing, you get this energy pumping um, behavior uh, based on the stored energy. And we compared, um, again, analytically compared uh, what would be the power profile when you allowed sort of um, this active stiffness versus when you control it um, in a non-bag drivable stiff way. And indeed, you get um, the fact the energy required to drive certain things is, is less in, in, a, in a passive um, stiffness scenario. Um, what's, uh, of course, you can actually vary the, the effort term and the penal so you can penalize the effort term more or less, and you get different behaviors, which is um, appropriately conducive Okay, so here, here, just a minute. Uh, let me just run this video through. I have no control over when to stop that. So, so this is with with weight. Oh, jeez. Okay, sorry. Not very good at. Try that again. Okay, so this is with weight. You penalize the effort weight this way. So you don't penalize the energy too much. Then you change this energy a penalization. You start penalizing energy more. And then you will see that for the same cost function, the distance thrown is less. Um, and you get the picture. So I'm not going to run through all the uh, other uh, iterations. So you will have, um, the more you change this, you get for the same control cost, different lengths. Yes, Malu. With the variable uh, sure. pumping in energy. Yep. And if I now think about total energy pumped into the system, that's clearly higher, which is why you throw further. Uh -huh. is, is the, is, so I'm w wondering if this is a fair comparison, because if I now use an arm with constant stiffness but have a bigger motor, the energy budget is conserved. Yeah. Like what, what do I uh, add up between? I agree. So one needs to take into account the cost of actually modulating or changing the stiffness. So this is something that we are considering very seriously. We haven't managed to uh, put it in numbers yet. So we, we are doing all sorts of ways of, um, of computing the cost of changing the, uh, the stiffness in this case. Um, actually, David or uh, Matt can tell you a bit more about the current effort that we are doing in that, but we haven't found out the best way of doing it. So that's why it's not there. But you're absolutely right. Um, OK, so let's see. Where are we? God. OK, so the, the other story is this one here. So now if we get uh, an optimization to throw, then what we did was you saw this little video of the thing throwing. Then what we did was we just changed the weight of the ball. That's all we did. We just changed the weight of the ball. Everything else is the same. The, the, the optimization is, um, cost is exactly the same. And what comes out of the optimization is, on the one hand, if you have a ball with below a certain, above a certain um, weight, you throw the underarm throw. And if you had, and see, this is the underarm throw. And then if you reduce the weight of the ball, then 
my video doesn't play. Let me try to do that. Okay, it's basically that's what happens when you just change the weight of the ball. Um, so effectively, the, the whole point of this illustration is that uh, you can get quite non-intuitive strategies. So you cannot predict ahead of time whether you should throw underarm or overarm um, for exactly the same cost function, and this optimization gives you this uh, thing automatically. So the the, the, the advantage of optimization is that you don't have to guess what's a good strategy. Okay, so the next bit of the story is now we've also done this whole uh, optimization business. This is relatively new work um, and this is um, work that's been accepted at IROS, and this is for periodic movement task and temporal optimization. So there are two things here. There's one that we want to consider tasks which are rhythmic, um, for example, walking, vacation. Um, in addition to that, we also want to consider how do we optimize time. So far, we've given what is the time horizon. So the next step is how do we actually optimize time? So what are the key ingredients that we need to ask um, when it comes to periodic movements. So we need to figure out what is a suitable representation for the periodic movement uh, for trajectories and goals. Um, how do you design a cost function for periodic movements? It's not as trivial. Um, and how do you exploit resonance for energy efficient control? So, so exploiting this involves two aspects. It involves optimizing the frequency of the temporal aspect as well as stiffness tuning. So these are the two aspects um, of um, working with periodic movements. Um, okay, so our first attempts at doing that, um, you can think of the standard optimization criterion with some sort of uh, terminal cost and some running cost, and the terminal cost in this case can be, for example, one, one choice of a terminal cost can be um, that you want the final state and the initial state to coincide because it's a rhythmic movement. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and you can have a running cost, um, which is again, some you get some reference trajectory from some movement, um, like you can take a person walking and uh, use that as a reference trajectory uh, and start optimizing it in terms of a, like a reference control um, following a trajectory. Now, um, using this, this representation, this particular representation that we use, we can actually interpret this, um, this result as another view of, given another view of the cost function. Um, in other words, the running cost like this um, can effectively be rewritten as, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the dynamical movement primitives, um, this can be written in a dynamical movement primitive framework such that um, the limit attractors basically allow natural uh, convergence to certain, um, certain limit cycle behaviors. So, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this. The details are in the paper. Uh, but again, you can reformulate uh, the running cost using much more compact notations. Um, and you say the find control u and parameter omega. In this case, this is the temporal aspect, temporal parameter, such that the plant dynamics in one behaves like two and three while minimizing the control cost. Okay, so, so what's... Oh, geez, I have to get um, familiar with this one here. Okay. So, a, a small note on temporal optimization. Uh, why is temporal optimization so important? Because um, fixing temporal parameters is not optimal. Obviously, you cannot sort of pick up a time out of the, out, out of the sky um, in air. So, um, time stationary cost cannot deal with sequential task. Uh, typically, people chain first exit time controllers, and these are not optimal. Um, unless you consider linear duration costs. Um, so, so what we came up with is a canonical time formulation. And this is, uh, again, work um, that's been published at NIPS last year. Um, so the details are there. But I c I'll give you the gist of it. Um, so given the dynamics function uh, and some set of final costs, so if you have wire points, you will have a set of final costs because you've got to hit different points at different time. 
and some running cost, uh, where TI represents the time, what we do is we, we introduce um, a small notational change which basically creates a canonical time representation. So, okay. So once we do that, um, we can just replace the canonical time here, the real time here with the canonical time formulation uh, and then um, essentially take this framework in the context of uh, optimization. And this is again an algorithm um, called the approximate inference algorithm. This uses uh, Bayesian inference techniques to actually solve for the, the, the actual um, appropriate canonical time inference. So there's an E step um, which involves solving the optimal control problem and an M step which optimizes the beta which corresponds to the canonical time. So again, the details are in the, in the paper. Um, it's an inference algorithm which works uh, with forward backward message passing um, and that's all, that's the sort of gist of it. So um, f uh, let's just ignore this one for the moment. Uh, the, the nice thing is if you've got, a good example is if you've got to reach from this point to this point via two, two wire points, um, then typically first exit strategies don't predict what is the right thing to do. Um, but if you use this framework, then you, you find that you take into account the total duration such that you put appropriate scalings of the time and the velocities um, in the right way. Yes, Joe. Sorry? Okay, so first exit strategy basically says you, you plan for moving from here to here, the best thing to do, and then you start from where you end here and you basically plan the second bit in completely independently of each other. So you chain things one after the other. Uh, and this is quite obvious that if you do that, uh, you will not accelerate in the right way. Uh, because the, the, the way you need to end up with uh, depends on where your intermediate states are. So if you have your wire point exactly in the middle, that's, that's fine. Then the strategy works. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay, so. So we've now taken this framework and applied it to a problem um, of temporal optimization in brachiation. So, by the way, this work is purely in simulation, um, but it highlights the key aspects of this, um, of the, or the importance of this um, formulation. Um, so again, you can sort of formulate some cost function, some running, some final costs, some running costs, um, and this is a gripper. This is a two-link gripper with a single actuator. So it's an under-actuated brachiation robot, so to say. Um, and again, we optimize not only for the commands, uh, but we also optimize the time. So the time for duration of a single swing. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you the results. Um, I'm just going to show you two videos first and want to, I want you to see if you can notice any difference. So that's one. So that's the, well, let's see the other one. That's the second one. So if you look at the two things, it's very, very similar. Okay. Um, geez. Work. So indeed, if you look at the trajectories, if you look at the joint angle trajectory, so these are the two joint angle trajectories. The uh, for and these are these are joint trajectories optimized for different times. They look fairly similar. So, but let me tell you the the optimal one is the second one, and that is uh, the blue, and the red one is one of the suboptimal one. That's the one you saw right at the beginning. If you look at the trajectories, there's not much difference, but if you look at the actual forces that you need to apply to create that movement, uh, there's a massive difference. So the red one is the, is the command profile, the torques, the elbow torques that you need to apply. Uh, the blue one is the elbow torques that you need to apply for the optimized strategy. Um, so it's, it's almost, well, this is again ignoring friction and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's very little. So, so the point here is that by optimizing time, by tuning the planning to the, uh, the natural dynamics of your plant, you can actually create much more efficient actuation systems. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, now, we've done this for swing up as well, and we have a similar set of analysis for swing up tasks, but I'll just show you the video. Um, it's fun. So this is June's work here. Um, and 
you can see this is the optimized um, spatiotemporal uh, pattern for the swing up. Um, so if anybody would like to implement this on a real hardware, you can uh, give it a shot. Okay. So, so that's, that was uh, periodic movements. Now, now let's remove the assumption that we know the actuator dynamics. So let's say we do not have a reasonably good knowledge of the actuator dynamics. So then this is actually some of our old work that we've done with learning dynamics now applied to, so this is what Patrick was mentioning. Um, so I've been for, for, for ages working on this sort of learning dynamics, um, machine learning for learning in robots. Um, so we've now tried and applied that in the context of variable impedance robots. Um, and this is what we call optimal feedback control with learned dynamics. Okay, so how does that go? So um, the, 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 the gist of the whole learning framework is this algorithm uh, called LWPR, uh, which many of you are familiar with. We've got nice little packages which you can download from our website and, and try on different problems. Um, and this is a nonlinear function approximation algorithm which takes noisy data and fits nonlinear functions in an adaptable way. Um, and not only that, it also gives you the associated noise variance uh, with the fit. So when you learn, you learn not only the signal part, so to say, the, the mean, but you also learn the variance. Um, and this is an efficient way of doing it. Okay, so what can we use it for in the context of um, optimal control or variable impedance? So if you remember the story um, of OFC, we initially said a few slides back, if you have a task and you have a cost function then, and you have some analytical dynamics, then you apply your stochastic optimal control law and out comes a control law, which is a combination of a sequence of commands and some gains. And then you execute it on a plant. Now, what we change is we replace this analytical dynamics with something with a learning loop. Okay? So you, you do something, you collect some data, you have some internal model learning algorithm. This is using, in our case, using this LWPR algorithm. Um, and you learn the dynamics. Um, you not only learn the dynamics, you're able to adapt for any changes. For example, if you've got a perturbation or if you um, are in these experiments, forced adaptation experiments, which change your dynamics, then you can actually learn the dynamics on the fly. You can not only learn the dynamics on the fly, but you can also learn the associated uncertainty with the, with the, of, of, the, of the actual plant. Okay, so if you have all that and you learn, and then you apply the optimal feedback controller, so you, you replace the analytical model with this learned model, and then did the whole same machinery all over again. Okay, so what's, what's good about that? Okay, so this is, this is for the, so the, there's, there's some good news for the roboticists and there's some good news for people doing human motor control. So the, the, the good news for the robotics community is that um, traditionally when you plan end effector trajectories, say you want to reach from this position to A, B, and C, then you, you get typically low variance in your end effector. But if you look at humans, how humans behave, they've got large variance in their joints. Um, so if you look at joints, they are typically, uh, you forget, just, just ignore the, the two comparisons. These are just comparisons about how well the learning one does with the analytical one. But, but the, the whole point is you can get quite accurate end effector movements uh, in spite of large null space deviations. So the planning doesn't have to be very, uh, it doesn't have to be um, um, deterministic at the level of joints to achieve um, the, the fine control at the level of the end effectors. And this is, I mean, if, if, you, if you know Emo's work, then this is the minimum intervention principle. Yes. Maybe this is a good place to then. Uh, so I agree with you that if it, it doesn't have to be well controlled in the null space, right? But why does it choose to be noisy in the null space? Well, so you, here in, in, in the yeah. robotic system, you have a well-defined cost. That's noise. It's because if you get while you're moving, if you're getting perturbed. So this is this is a, uh, this is an example of if you are getting perturbed uh, during movement, then you do not correct in task irrelevant dimensions. That's all. 
It does. It's it, it, so also the initial conditions that you start with okay. changes. So if you start with a position which is slightly like this, as opposed to like this, with the same end effector, then when you're reaching for this movement, it doesn't have to follow exactly the same trajectory in the null space. So g given that this is noise in the system, let's say I, I tr explicitly try to control the amount of noise in the null space. Yep. How, what is the added energetic cost really to your controller? Do you have an intuitive sense for it? I, mean, I guess I'm wondering, is it really that energetically expensive that you don't want to do it, or is it sm small differences? Well, okay, so I don't have an answer to that in terms of the energy, but I think um, the, the whole reason for doing that is because you can now put additional constraints on the null space. So you can have, you know, this is what, um, uh, what Khatib is going to talk about, uh, and yesterday there was some talk about from Neville and, um, and, and Alan about, um, you know, these sort of hierarchical control spaces. So this is just a way of saying that we can do it, but you're right. Um, doesn't have to be. Uh, we're not. We're not forcing it to be variable, basically. But but you don't have to correct for things which doesn't need to be corrected. For example, if you've got different initial starting conditions, then you may follow in the null space. You may want to follow slightly different um, start depending on if you want to have minimum deviations from your initial pose, for example. Then, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. We've we've done this scaling for OFC to real hardware, and but given Alan's impressive videos, I don't think this is going to convince any of you that this is a good method. Uh, it is a good method, but I'm going to skip this. Um, but for the for the people who do human motor control, um, I think there's an interesting story here. So, for example, uh, there's many of you who work on reaching movements with force field adaptation, um, and um, if you now do optimal control on this, so in other words, you you f you stand you start an optimal control framework and ask uh, you to reach straight, and then you switch on um, a dynamics model, and there's a mismatch between the true dynamics model and what is actually happening. And then, if the optimal controller actually plans using the the what it believes is the right model, then you will actually predict that this deviation is the optimal strategy or, or is, is, is the consequence of your, of your actions. Now, you can use this framework and then you can adapt or improve your model as you move and as your, your dynamics model becomes closer to the reality, the optimal feedback controller tells you that uh, or, or the commands that come out of the optimal feedback controller will get you back to, to the, the, the right nominal uh, pose. So this is a way of explaining um, some of the adaptation, and we've done this for both for unidirectional force fields and velocity-dependent divergent force fields, and, and it works quite nicely in, with this learning framework. Okay, uh, and this is a note. Uh, I don't think this is very... Uh, this is people who really work with optimal feedback control. Uh, it's quite useful. Um, so it's a side effect. Um, let me just... For, for completeness, let me do that. So those of you who really worked with optimal feedback control and use algorithms like ILQG, you actually need to compute finite differences um, for computing these iterations. But the good thing about um, representing this learned model as a particular way of doing this using LWPR is that we get, because of this, from the learned model, we get the partial derivatives analytically. So the computations that are required for computing this ILQG updates become much more efficient. Um, ask me more later if you are specifically interested in this, but this is a side. Okay, so then we did that, and then we said, oh, fine, we get nice um, results with adaptation, uh, or maybe we should try and uh, look at what human models of, of human um, muscles do. So we did do a uh, a simulation on a six degree of freedom um, sort of uh, two sorry two two joint six muscle um, this is the Kawato arm model um, and we looked at what happens to the coactivation um, if you did the same experiment of you know reaching and adaptation and and you, we had the same energetic cost function so there is some trade off between um, energy and um, um, and the accuracy of reaching. So, so we, we get the patterns of 
reaching, the trajectory patterns are correct, uh, and you get some after effects as well. But funnily enough, it's, it's hard to read here, but you do not get co-contraction out of these muscles. Um, so uh, we asked, oh, so why is that? So this is a bit strange. Um, so it turns out that, um, oops, wrong direction. So, so the, the kind of kinematic noise of the, of the dynamics that we were putting into the system was something like this. So um, the signal dependent noise tells you that if you increase the activation, you get increased noise in, in muscle one and same story in muscle two. So in other words, as you increase the activation, you get larger noise in your muscle. Um, so if you put that model, co-contraction doesn't come out of, of, of this, um, this framework of optimal control. However, if you notice that when you do co-contraction, there may be larger, there may be larger noise in individual muscles, but what happens to the dynamics of the plant, the plant end effector dynamics becomes more stable when you co-contract. So instead of being more noisy, when you co-contract, you are less noisy at the level of the plant. So basically, there was a mismatch between uh, what the real plant does and what really happens. So once we, you know, we can now either build in really detailed models of what the plant does, and Alistair here works on, uh, on building uh, detailed models of, of uh, wrists and, and arms. You can either use that, or we can take the, the effect of a plant um, and say that, yes, this is the kind of noise that, that, that comes out. Um, so if we do that, and we use that, for example, using this uh, combination of isotonic and isometric noise function, and we run our optimal control framework again, uh, we get some nice uh, matches to real experimental data. Uh, so this is... Um, what happens when there's a higher accuracy demand. So this is classical experiments about if you, in, if you increase your accuracy demand. So this is reducing errors. So A is a task which you have to reach to a large target and E is a task where you have to reach to a small target. Um, then the interesting thing to note here is that you get increasing co-contraction levels with increasing endpoint error. Um, so this nicely sort of matches um, the predictions. Um, I must say qualitatively, because you can tween all sorts of parameters. Um, so I'm not a believer of saying, oh, it matches the data perfectly, because a lot of parameters can, um, can give you different results. So, but what the, the other thing that was nice was we also did this for adaptation to external force fields. And when you have a movement from a null field to a force field, so when you have initially your model matches, um, then you s start off with the force field, what happens is you get some large errors in the beginning, and prediction uncertainty blows up, and you get co-contraction. But what happens is, as the model learns, you see a reduction in the, in the co-contraction levels um, as the prediction uncertainty goes down. So this nicely reflects what happens um, in, a, in a real adaptation experiment. Um, and I don't want to spend more time on this. This doesn't happen in a deterministic uh, framework without noise included. OK. so. So I think this is a nice, uh, this is a half time, uh, more than half time <laughs> break um, to s sort of look at what we went through. So if we have a good knowledge of the 